Welcome to Excel and Business Math video number 27. Hey, in this video, we got to talk about bank reconciliation. And we'll talk a little bit about checks, types of endorsements for checks, some terms used in bank reconciliation. But really, bank reconciliation, this is an amazingly important skill that many graduates from college do not have. Now, I once went to an accounting conference, and this accounting recruiter said that she couldn't believe these two-year, four-year MBA students that came trying to get accounting jobs couldn't do basic bank reconciliation. Now, it sounds scary, but no way. It is totally straightforward and easy. And in this video, we'll see how to Think about bank reconciliation so it is not a difficult topic. We'll also get to see two cool Excel tricks. We'll see how to view two different sheets simultaneously. So we'll have a sheet in our workbook with our checkbook register and the bank statement. And then on a completely different sheet, we'll have our bank reconciliation form. And then at the end of the video, this is not required for the business math class, but I'll show you a cool trick for conditional formatting and data validation that will allow you to simply type an X, meaning we reconciled this item, and the whole row will turn yellow. All right, we want to start off by going over to the sheet checks. Now, I briefly want to look at a check. But instead of doing it over here in Excel, I want to go to our PDF notes. Now, a definition of a check, a check is a written, dated, and signed negotiable instrument. Negotiable instrument means you can take a check written out to you and sign it over to someone else that contains an unconditional order from the pay or that's the person who wrote the check that directs a bank to pay a definite sum of money to the payee. Now, we're going to look at the parts of a check, but very important, there's something called a cancel check. Here's two old checks from the 90s when I ran a business down in California using Bank of America. This is the front of the check, and this is the back. Now, this is Pacific Bell and Bank One. When those two businesses took the check and deposited it, the banks actually took the money from my bank, and they put it into Pacific Bell's bank account and Bank One's bank account. In the process, they have these marks on the back. These are stamps. These are the official record that says the money was moved from one account to another. These are called canceled checks. Now, in the old days, businesses would keep these, and it was the best proof that the transaction occurred. In the old days, we actually got an envelope every single month with all of the canceled checks. That doesn't happen anymore. But these pictures are at your online bank account. And anytime there's a dispute about a payment, if you have this canceled check, that's the best proof that the transaction occurred, meaning the money moved from your account to the payee's account. Don't get confused. Canceled check does not mean void. It just means the stamps are on the back that prove that the money was moved from one account to another. Now let's go to the next sheet, parts of a check. This check is for Sue's accounting. That's the payor's address. Ah, there's the check number, 4025. That's a unique sequential check number. Those check numbers, of course, are important because they help track this check later, like when we're trying to do our bank reconciliation from the bank statement. And we want sequential numbers, no missing check numbers. If there's a missing check, you got to go investigate because that is trouble. There's the date. That means this amount here written as a number and as words can be paid on that date or after. Right there, number four, that's called the ABA, the American Bankers Association number. The numerator shows us information about the state and the city for the bank. The denominator tells us information about the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, five, pay to the order of. That's the payee. So Sue's accounting is paying Home Depot. Now, six and seven, these are the amounts for the check. If there's a discrepancy, the written 
description of the amount supersedes the actual written number. Now, I told you back in video eight, I think it was a funny story. I, back in the 90s, wrote a huge check. And for some reason, I wrote the words $1,000 less than the actual written number. And of course, the bank took that and gave the person that our business owed the money $1,000 too little. So of course, I got a bill later, and I was surprised. And sure enough, when I went back and looked at the check, there it was. So words supersede numbers. There's the bank address. There's the memo. This is important. Always, if you're a business, write the description of where this is going. Later, we can use that to make our entry into the accounting system with the right expense account. There's the pay or signature. That signature has to match the card kept by the bank. And then down here, we have our routing numbers. There's the numbers associated with the banks and the Federal Reserve. There's our account number. And there's the check number, same as up here. Now I want to go to the next page, endorsements. Yes, when we try to deposit a check or someone tries to deposit one of our checks that we gave to them, you have to sign the back. That allows the bank to run the transaction and take the money from one account to another. Now, this is called a blank endorsement. That's when you just sign your name. The trouble with this is if you drop this on the ground, anybody can pick it up and use it, deposit it into their bank. Really, it's much better, and most businesses have a stamp exactly like this. For deposit only, into, and then you put the account number, and then you sign your name. This is called a restricted endorsement. There's also a qualified endorsement. Pay to the order of Sue Rad Coolinator without recourse, and then I sign my name. This means I'm transferring it over to Sue Rad Coolinator if it didn't say without recourse, Sue Red Coolinator could come back after me if the check bounced or something like that. But when it says without recourse, forget it. Sue cannot come back after me if the check bounces. All right, endorsements. Now I want to go over to Excel and talk about specific terms that we might see for bank reconciliation, and then we'll do a bank reconciliation. Now I'm over here on the sheet Y bank reconciliation. Now, what is bank reconciliation? Well, here's the problem. This is our checkbook register. These are the withdrawals and the deposits that we've been keeping track of. And look at this. At the end of the month, our balance is 4,243.75. And then either in the mail or more typically now, we just go online and look at what's called the bank statement. Well, guess what? This is our checking account. This is our money. Of course, we're going to keep track of it. But when we deposit the money into the bank, they owe us this money. They're just using it temporarily. So they also have to track, just like we do, every single transaction. But what? The bank statement or the online balance is 10,656.26. Why is that totally different than our checkbook balance? The reason is simple. There are some transactions that we know about, like this deposit that hasn't made it to the bank yet. So that's an amount that we know about that the bank doesn't know about. And look at this. On the 27th, Sure enough, that customer from France transferred in the money. So that's an amount that the bank knows about that we do not know about. Here's interest paid. That means we get interest on our amount in this checking account and a service fee. Those are examples of items that we don't know about yet. So why do we do bank reconciliation? Because we have to make sure that that different number and that different number on the bank statement are actually the same. Once we take all the items from the bank statement that we don't know about and use them on our side, and then we take the numbers that the bank doesn't know about and put them on the bank side, we better have 
adjusted checkbook balance exactly equal to adjusted bank balance. Now, on this sheet, I want to show you how to do it just in a simple way. Then we're going to go use an official form and do an official bank reconciliation. Now, before we do this, let's look at some terms that we might see associated with bank statements and bank reconciliation. Now, ATM debit cards, we probably have all used a debit card to directly withdraw cash from our bank account when we're making a purchase at Target or something like that. But you can also go to your ATM machine and do all sorts of transactions. Withdraw cash. Make a deposit, including checks. Check our balance transfer and all sorts of things. Also, on our bank statement, if we're not paying attention, if we use ATMs that are not associated with our bank, we could get charged one, two, three, or more dollars. Now, online banking, we can now go online and do all sorts of things, make payments. In fact, many of the times we don't use checks anymore. Checks are not a thing of the past because oftentimes there's some situations where you have to use a check or we're mailing it or it's for a large amount and you have to present it directly. But So we still use checks, but lots of times we go online to make our payments or transfer funds or much more. Now, things that can show up on our bank statement, electronic payments or transfers. Now, if we go to our online bank and make a payment, we better be recording that on our side. But we can receive funds electronically, so we might get something from a customer or a bank wire transfer. There also might be fees associated with that. If you get a transfer from a different country, you might get ch charged you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks. We also may find on our bank statement, uh-oh, NSF, that means not sufficient funds. Now, we might see it on our end. We bounce a check. So we tried to withdraw money from our account, like with a check, but there wasn't enough money. Also, return deposited item. That's also referred to not sufficient funds. But that's when we try to deposit someone else's check, and their bank account didn't have enough money. In both cases, NSF, when we try to withdraw from our account or when we try to deposit, we might see big fees charged to our account that, that we then have to subtract from our checking account balance. We might have an improperly filled out check. And in fact, our third example, we will go check online for a check we deposited and sure enough, the bank thought it was for a different amount. Well, if we find an improperly filled out check, that means our side and the bank side have them listed for different amounts. So we will have to fix that. We also might go to the bank and order a stop payment order, cashier's check, money order. We might have fees associated with all of those. Also, two really important terms in bank reconciliation deposits in transit, and outstanding checks. Now, deposit in transit, that means exactly what it says. That means we made a deposit, but it's still on the way to the bank. Outstanding checks, that's when we wrote the check, but it hasn't gotten deposited yet. In both cases, those are items that we know about that the bank doesn't know about. All right, I'm going to slide this out of the way. All right, I sort of already mostly completed this first example just to emphasize that in our records, there's two items that the bank doesn't know about. And over here, there's three items that we don't know about. All right, I'm just going to see if I can do this manually here, right? That's my balance. But it looks like for my balance to be correct, I'm going to have to add the transfer, add the interest, and subtract the service fee. So down here, I'm going to say equals. There's what's called the start checkbook balance. Plus, there's the transfer in. Plus, there's the interest minus. And there's the service charge. So whatever that amount is, when I do the same type of adjustments to the bank, I better get exactly the same number here. So you ready? Equals, well, there's what the bank thinks is in our account. 
we have a plus, that's a deposit in transit, and a minus. That's an outstanding check. So you ready? Plus the deposit that the bank doesn't know about, minus the check that they do not know about. And when I hit Enter, these two amounts better be equal. We can even check in Excel, of course, is that equal to, there's a comparative operator, this one, and when I hit Enter, I hope it says true. That's all there is to bank reconciliation. You have to make sure that the actual amounts for both different people, this is us, this is the bank. We're keeping track of what's happening to our account, but so is the bank. So bank reconciliation, we have to make sure that the two numbers are actually the same. Now, there's other approaches to doing a bank reconciliation. Notice we did our calculations off to the side. But what we really need to do is actually get the numbers from the bank statement and bring them into our checkbook register. Also, there's an official bank reconciliation form that sometimes businesses use. All right, I'm going to scroll over and look at example two. Now, here we have our checkbook register and then the bank statement. Now, when we do this either manually, I remember doing this by hand, or even in Excel, or even in an accounting program like QuickBooks, we usually have some column where we put a mark that means we found this on the bank statement. What we're going to do is we're going to put an X anytime we find a particular item in the checkbook register and in our bank statement. But even more importantly than that, anytime we find something in the bank statement that's not in our records, we're going to record it in our checkbook register. All right, let's start here. I'm looking for check number 12118 for 2275. And sure enough, I find it right here. So watch this. In the reconciliation column, I've added a drop down arrow that allows us to select an X. And instantly, that whole row is highlighted in yellow, meaning we found this on the bank statement. Now, at the end of this video, I'll actually show you how to use data validation and conditional formatting to do this in your own checkbook register. All right, so I found it in both places, so I'm going to put an X. Now I'm looking for check. 12119-375-11, and sure enough, there it is. So I'm going to put an X in both places. I'm looking for this deposit here for 1,257 and so on. There's a deposit, 1,257 and 91 pennies. So that one is in both statements or both accounting systems. All right, looks like we have an electronic transfer to City Lights for that amount there. And sure enough, here is the electronic reference number, and the amount is correct. So I'm going to put an X in both places. All right, deposit. There it is, 3,550 and one penny. I do not see it over here. I am not putting an X. Check number 12120 for that amount. I do not see it over here, so I'm not putting an X. Now I'm looking over here in the bank statement. I definitely do not see this over here. I do not see either one of these items over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this item over, 2-27 tab. If I was looking at a piece of paper, I'd have to type it out. If I was looking online, I would copy it, right? So I'm going to copy that and paste. Tab. Now, they don't have any indication of what this is for, but we know this was for, this was a customer payment from Fox LMI company in France, and it was for invoice 200 and a 2. I'm going to change the column width here. This was definitely an addition, 7624 and 50 cents, and there we go. So I'm going to put an X in both places now. The next one, interest paid for 247. This was on 228. Interest paid. Interest turned on checking account. And this is definitely a deposit for $2.47. I'm going to put an X in both places. And then we have a service fee on 228. 
monthly service fee. And that is a reduction, 1.25. And I'm going to put an X in both locations. We're going to copy our formula down. We'll actually learn how to create this checkbook register, including a couple of cool formulas in our next video. There is the balance. So our checkbook balance is the correct balance. But I'm going to double check down here. There's only two items that the bank doesn't know about. So I'm going to say, hey, there is the balance from the bank. There's plus one deposit minus one check that they don't know about yet, and Enter. And so both of those better be equal. Now, anytime you do a bank reconciliation, sometimes you're going to do it on a form like our next example. But that's really the most important part as we take additions and subtractions from what the bank knows about and put those into our system. Now, this is just the checkbook register. And this is a math class, so we're learning just the math of it. But in your accounting classes, and if you're doing accounting or bookkeeping, you would then have to go enter these in as official journal entries, debits and credits and all of that. But for us in this class, we just got our bank balance in our checkbook register up to the correct number. Now we want to go look at example three. I'm going to click on the sheet EX parentheses three. Here's our checkbook register. Here's our bank statement. But in this example, we have slightly different numbers on the bank statement. And we want to see how to use a bank reconciliation form. So I'm going to click on EX3BR form. Here's our bank reconciliation form. And it functions the same way we did in our first example. We will start with a bank statement balance and then add and subtract to get to an adjusted balance. And then we'll start with our checkbook balance and add and subtract to get to the adjusted balance. And those two better be equal. Now notice something. We are working between two different sheets now. Now this will be the first time we've done this, but we're totally allowed to create a formula on this sheet that will pull numbers from this sheet. Now we could do it by clicking back and forth between the sheets, but I got to show you a great trick. We can actually view both of these sheets simultaneously by going up to the View Ribbon tab. And what we're going to do is we're going to click New Window. Now, before I click New Window, I want you to notice the title up here lists just the title. Not only that, but down here, there's just one workbook open. But watch what happens when I click New Window. Instantly, it opens up a copy of the same workbook. Now, let's look up in the title bar. You can tell that there's a second workbook, which is a copy of that other one, because there's a number two in the title bar. If you look down to the task bar down here and hover your cursor, there's two instances of the same workbook. Now, I can click back and forth, and it's exactly the same workbook. Now, we want to show both workbooks side by side. So we go back up to View. And in the Window group, we click Arrange All. Now, Arrange All will allow us to show one on the left and one on the right. I'm going to select Vertical, click OK, and look at that. I'm looking at the same exact workbook in two windows. Now, let's scroll over in the workbook on the left to expose the sheet EX3. Now let's come over to the workbook on the right, scroll over with your scroll arrows, and there it is. The same exact sheet is being shown in two different windows. Now you can prove this to you. Watch. I'm going to click here, and when I type Sheet and Enter, whoa, it's in both workbooks. Now that's not what we want to do, but I wanted to show you that when you have Arrange and you've opened up two windows, it's exactly the same sheet. We're just looking at it twice. Now I'm going to delete this, because what we really want is I want to click on the right on the sheet EX3BR form. Now we have two different sheets from the same workbook exposed. And we can work back and forth between the two. Now we can change the size of the window. And I want to change the size of the window on the right. Click and drag. And then I'm going to try to do that on the left. I see my horizontal white arrow, so I can click and drag. 
Now over on this side, I'm going to hold Control and roll the wheel on my mouse because I want to see both the checkbook register and our bank statement. Now we still have to start on this side and verify all of the transactions that occur in both. And then the ones that don't occur in both, we'll use in our reconciliation form. All right, now the first transaction already has an X in yellow because that was reconciled last period. But now we're looking for check 12118 for 2275. Sure enough, we find it on both sides. So I'm going to add an X to both sides. We found that transaction. Check 12119-37511. It's on the there bank side, too. Side. All right, a deposit for $1,257.91. There's a deposit. There's the exact same amount, so I'm going to exit out on both sides. Now here is an electronic bill pay, Seattle City Lights. There's $298.73. There's the reference number, uh-oh, $288.73. There is a difference between the two. Now, as soon as we see a difference, one of the sides made an error. We're going to assume that the bank is correct. So that means we wrote a check for 298 or we recorded it $10 more than the bank subtracted. So when we do our bank reconciliation, that's a difference. We're actually going to have to add 10 bucks back in on our side. Now, I'm going to leave a note down at the bottom. I'm going to get that reference number tab equals Seattle City Lights tab. And the difference is 10. And I have the numbers here, so I'm going to do a formula. That cell reference minus that cell reference over there. And that's the 10 bucks that we'll have to add back in. Now, why do we have to add back in? Well, because we subtracted 298, which means $10 more than the bank did. So if we subtracted too much, when we add it back in, that'll help us get back to the same number right there. Now, as we look down, this deposit for $3,550.01, I do not see that here. I do not see this check listed on the bank side either. Over here in the bank statement, there is a customer transfer from France. That is a positive that we don't have on our side. There's some interest we don't have, service fee, and an ATM. All right, now, all of the items without color we're going to have to somehow incorporate in this bank reconciliation form. Now, again, it's going to work similarly to how we did it the first time. And in fact, we're going to list our bank statement balance and our checkbook balance, and then we'll fill in all the detail to get to our adjusted numbers. All right, this will be the first time we've actually done a formula that looks to a different sheet. So watch this, equal sign, and I need to get the bank statement balance. I click once to activate this window. Then I click a second time, and it puts the cell reference in. But look at that. That's called a sheet reference. Yes, it's got the cell reference in 11, but it also has the sheet name. Now, if you look over here, there's the sheet name. Anytime you refer to a cell on a different sheet, it'll always be polite and put the name of the sheet in. Now, it's listing single apostrophes around the sheet name, and then it has an explanation point. That explanation point is the syntax that tells Excel this text in the formula is actually a sheet name. So when I hit Enter, It'll totally get that number from that other sheet. Now let's get our checkbook balance. I click, type an equal sign. I come over, I click once to activate the window. Second time to click on the cell, there's our sheet reference. When I hit Enter, there's the number. All right, first thing we want to do is list the outstanding checks. Those are the checks that we wrote that the bank doesn't know about yet. So right here, I can see we only have one. So I'm going to do an equal sign to do a sheet reference. Click once, click a second time to get the cell reference. I see my sheet reference in tab. I need the amount, equal sign. Click once, click twice. There's our sheet reference, and Enter. 
Now, we only have one. Oftentimes, you have many. But we only have one, so I'm going to come to the bottom and add Alt equals and Enter. Now, let's adjust the bank statement balance. Now, usually these forms are polite. They'll actually describe the process you need to go through. Now, a form like this is pretty standard. And back in the day when bank statements were mailed out instead of electronic, you would see this form on the back of your bank statement. And you could use it to make sure that both balances were really the same. So we read the instructions. List any deposits made by you and not yet recorded by the bank. Well, we have one deposit. So I'm going to type an equal sign. And our deposit is right there. So I click once, click on the cell, and Enter. Now it's telling us to add all the numbers from above right here. Alt equals. It doesn't guess right, so I'm going to highlight and Enter. Now it wants us to put the total of the checks outstanding and then subtract it. Equal sign, click on the total at the bottom, and Enter. Now it's polite. It says subtract 4 from 3. This is the adjusted balances. Equals up arrow, up arrow, minus up arrow, and Enter. That is our adjusted balance. Hopefully, when we adjust our checkbook, we'll get the same number down here. Now there's the balance. It says fees deducted by the bank, not yet subtracted from your checkbook. No problem. We have one of those. Equal sign. That's the one fee, $1.25. Now, sometimes these forms don't have the right slots for everything. So now it says other subtractions. So you'd have to go through and get all of the subtractions. Well, we only have one in ATM. So equal sign, click once, click twice. There's our sheet reference and Enter. Now subtract the lines. We have two subtractions, so we're going to subtract line 8 and 7 from 6 equals up arrow minus up arrow minus up arrow. And when I hit Enter, that's the total after the subtractions. Now additions such as transfers are received by the bank and correction, so equals. There's our one transfer plus. There's our addition. And when I hit Enter, that's the amount we're going to have to add. And then it has a line for interest that's different than those two up there. So I go and get the interest of 247. Click twice. I get the cell reference and Enter. Now we can add all three of these numbers. I'm going to Alt equals. It gets it totally wrong. So I'm simply going to highlight those numbers we should add and Enter. And there we go. Luckily, we got two numbers that are in balance, but I'm going to check using a logical formula, equal sign. Cell reference equal sign is a comparative operator. And let's check if they are equal. And we get our logical true. Now, this is just one of many different types of reconciling forms. And we saw two other ways to do it. Sometimes you don't really need to use a reconciling form. You just need to get all the correct information into your records like we did in our second example. Now, I do want to show you one last thing in this video. I want to show you how to add a dropdown to add an X and how to highlight an entire row. Now, we still have two workbooks open. And guess what? I can just close one of them, maximize this one here, and now when I go over to the sheet EX3, of course it's filled out because I was looking at two different sheets from the same workbook. I'm going to be sure and click Control S. Now I want to go over to the sheet DV and CF. All right, the DV is for data validation, and the CF is for conditional formatting. Now what I want is a drop down. So I'm going to highlight these cells. And the reason I want a drop down that allows me to enter an X is because if I go up to Data, and there's a button called Data Validation, I want to make sure that the only thing that gets entered into any one of these cells is the letter X. Because later, I'm going to use something called Conditional Formatting, and it's going to check whether someone entered an X here. I do not want someone to accidentally enter the letter E because then this conditional formatting will not work. So Control-Z, let's highlight the whole column. 
and validate what kind of data goes into this range of cells. Data validation, I'm just going to click the button. And it opens up this dialog box. Now, by default, you're allowed to put anything into any cell. But we can click the drop down. And there's all sorts of amazing things that we're not going to use in this class for data validation. You can validate a range of numbers, decimals, what type of date, all sorts of things. But what we want is a list. Now, we're going to come down to source. And this is kind of funny because usually you either type out a list or you highlight a range of cells. What we have is just a single item. I'm going to type capital X. And now there will be an in cell dropdown that shows this X. And that will be the only thing allowed. Now, you could go have fun and put an input message and an error alert. But we're not going to do that. We're simply going to put the X and click OK. Now, if I come here, there is a drop down with my X. Now, watch what happens when I try to type the letter T or whatever. I get this message. Now, if you want to have some fun, you can actually type out in the dialog box exactly what you want this to say. But we're not going to. I'm going to click Cancel. I'm going to delete that. Now, how do we get the row to turn yellow when we put an X there? Well, here's the thing. We're going to have to do a really fancy formula that will give us a true and false in each cell. Once we figure out what that formula is, we're going to come to Home, over to Conditional Formatting, and we're going to say New Rule. Now, Conditional Formatting is exactly what the title suggests. It will only format this row if the condition is met, which means cell F12 for this row has an X. When we get down here, every one of these cells is going to need either true, add the yellow, or false, don't add the yellow. Now, again, this is not required for this class, but I promised you I would show you this. But here's how it works. Instead of highlighting the whole range and going up here and typing the formula out in the dialog box, we can actually create our formula down in the cells, copy it over and down, and see if it works. And if it does, then we'll copy and paste the formula up into the dialog box. Now, here's what we want. Imagine this row represents that row right there. Well, every single cell has to look at that x. But when we copy the formula down, notice this went down three rows. That's going to represent this row. Well, this row shouldn't be looking at that x. It should be looking at the x in F14. So watch this. We're going to do equals. And remember, I'm going to copy this over and down, pretending that it's up here. Well, this whole row has to look at that x, which is F12. But notice, as I copy to the side, I need it locked on F12. But when I copy the formula down, that F12 needs to move to F13. So I have to use a mixed cell reference in this formula. Now, we saw this one other time in this class. It's not something really required for this class. But here's how we do it. I hit the F4 key once and twice and a third time to put the dollar sign in front of the F, but not the 12. Now what happens? When I copy to the side, the F is locked because of a dollar sign. But when I copy it down, the 12 doesn't have a dollar sign. So it'll move to 13. Now, as I copy this to the side, I can't be just looking at the cell. I have to create a logical formula that asks the question, are you an x? So we type an equal sign, a comparative operator, and then text has to be in double quotes, capital X, and double quote. That's a logical formula that asks, is there an x in that cell? Now watch this, Control-Enter. I'm going to copy it to the side and then copy it down. Now, I'm going to go to the very last cell and hit the F2 key to verify. Is that the correct cell reference? Yes. And in fact, you can check any row, F2. Look at that. That row represents that transaction in my checkbook register. And it's looking at the X column, tab, F2, tab, F2. It's always looking at the correct X column. Now watch this. When I come up here and select an X, that whole row turns to true. And that's the trick. 
we put that formula in the dialog box. And the dialog box will, in these cells, copy it over and down, enabling a true and false to be in the dialog box, which will either true add the formatting or false do not add the formatting. All right, so watch this. We have F2. That formula right there represents that cell. And so we're going to copy that formula. Notice that whole range right there, we're copying the upper leftmost formula in edit mode. Control C and then Enter. Now we're going to highlight this entire range. Because I copied the formula in the upper left, I made sure the active cell was in the upper left of the highlighted range. That way, when I paste the formula up in the dialog box, the dialog box in memory will put the formula there and copy it over and down. So you ready? I'm going to go up to Conditional Formatting. New Rule. I don't want any of these. I want Use a Formula to determine which cells to format. Down here it says Format Values where this formula is true. I click and I Control V to paste. That formula in this dialog box will be as if there's a formula in every cell. That formula will be copied over and down in memory, delivering a true and false to each cell. Now you can go click Format and use any one of these tabs to add any formatting that you want. I'm going to add yellow. Click OK. Click OK. And just like that, that is amazing. If I delete this, the formatting's gone. We can see the formula in action down here. By the way, these formulas don't have anything to do with the yellow up here. We just put those there so we could visually see what was going on. If I delete all these just for a second delete key, notice the formula we copied and pasted and put up in that dialog box is still there enacting the yellow. Now I'm going to leave that as a trail control Z. Now I can come to any row and click that X. And just like that, it adds the formatting. Control Z. Now let's do that over here. I'm going to highlight this range. Go up to Data, Data Validation button. I do not want to allow anything. I want to allow from a list. I'm going to type my list, which is a single item X. In cell dropdown, click OK. Now I'm going to come down here and create my formula equals, and it's that cell that will be in the dialog box representing that cell to copy over. I need to lock the M, but not the 12. So I hit the F4 key one, two, three times. And then I make a logical formula, are you equal to, in double quotes, capital X, in double quotes, Control Enter, copy it to the side, copy it down. I'm going to test it. I'm going to test the second row. I'm testing that X. They all turn true. Upper left-hand corner, I F2, and in Edit Mode, I Control C to copy, Enter. I highlight the range. Now, active cell right there, same cell that represents the top cell where I copied my formula. I go back to Home, over to Conditional Formatting, New Rule. I want Use a Formula to determine which cells to format. I need to click in Format Values where this formula is true and Control V. Now I click Format. Whatever you want, you can go crazy. Click OK, click OK. That is amazing. If I delete it, gone. If I come down here and click, totally adds the formatting. Now that's some Excel magic. Now again, data validation, drop down list, and conditional formatting using a logical formula with mixed cell reference is not required for this class. But I had to show you just in case you wanted to try it. Now, there are two homework problems where there's a checkbook and a bank statement and the bank reconciliation form right on this sheet. So two homework problems you can practice. This is an important skill, being able to simply pick out what's on the checkbook side that's not on the bank statement side and what's on the bank statement side that's not on the checkbook side, and make sure that both checkbook and bank statement are actually in agreement. All right, so we saw a lot about bank reconciliation. We talked about some important bank terms. 
we talked about different types of endorsements. Back on the sheet checks, we talked about the different parts of the checks. But really, it was bank reconciliation that we wanted to learn. All right, if you like that video, be sure to click that thumbs up, leave a comment, and sub, because there's always lots more videos to come from Excel is Fun, including next video, video 28. We'll actually build this checkbook register and learn a couple important formulas using is functions and the if function, which will be the first time we see if. All right, we'll see you next video.